good evening and welcome to you. And if you're online, a very warm welcome to you too. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I, my name's Stuart Fisher. I'm one of the elders here. And I'll be taking the service uh, today, to, this, uh, tonight. This morning, <laughs> get it right in a moment. Uh, we'll be a slightly different, as uh, those of you who were here this morning uh, may be aware. We're going to look at the life of a, uh, a person from history who did some great things for God. Now, that's not our normal practice, but occasionally it's good to be aware of what God has done with people's lives. And I'll give some reasons a little bit later as to why I think it's appropriate for us to do this uh, today. So we're going to start as normal with uh, the beginning of our service. And I'd like to welcome anyone here who's here for the first time, perhaps. And uh, do trust that God will bless you as you worship with us here tonight. So let's come before God. Let's all pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a free country where we can worship as we see right, that we don't have anyone telling us how to do it. And we just thank you for this great freedom that was won many years ago by others and we pray that it might always be so. Even though we live in days where things are changing and uh, the gospel is not as free as it once was, but we do pray for better days. We know that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And we ask, Lord, that we might even be privileged to see such days again when you work in great power. So hear our prayers as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come with the first song, which is very much about the gospel. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. <clears throat> Spread. 
turn to the first letter of Timothy and chapter 1. Just a short reading from verse 12 down to verse 17. Have you ever wondered if someone can be saved just by reading the word of God? It is possible, and the man we're going to be looking at tonight was saved by reading this passage. It jumped out at him. There's one verse in particular that we know quite well, and God has the power in his word to do that. It doesn't always work that way. Usually, there are human helpers, but sometimes the word of God is sufficiently powerful Well, it's always sufficiently powerful, but sometimes God chooses to do it that way and directly save a person. And Thomas Bilney, the man we'll be hearing about a little bit later, was just such a man. This was the passage that changed his life. So let's read it. We start at verse 12. This, of course, is Paul writing to a younger man, Timothy, who was to follow him in the gospel preaching. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason... I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's come before that great God. Let's all pray. Our God, in the silence and the quietness now, having just read that passage about the life of the Apostle Paul, how he was transformed. Amazing grace. A man who was setting out to destroy the church, if that were possible, to put Christians in prison, to persecute them, changed, transformed. And yet Paul himself never got over it. He always reckoned on the grace of God and marveled that he, as he considered himself the chief of sinners, the worst of sinners, could be saved. Lord, if it's possible to save a man like Paul, then there is nobody who is beyond your help. If there's anyone even listening tonight who feels that they're too hard for you, then here is hope. If you can save the chief of sinners, you can save any sinner. And we too, many of us here know that was just like us. That's our life story. We were just going in another direction and you turned us about and you changed us and it was nothing we did. It's not because you saw something in us that was good and potential. It's not because we did certain things to earn it. You just came, sheer grace and transformed our lives and we know you can do it for others. So our heart's prayer tonight is that you would work, not just tonight, but throughout the the weeks that lie ahead. We pray, Lord, as we come to you as a, a gospel church, 
that you'll ever keep us mindful and focused on these things, that we might encourage one another to persevere in the faith and to share our faith. And we ask, Lord, that you will come among us and help us because we cannot do anything without your help. We thank you for those in the past who have served you faithfully in this church who are now either unable to uh, through age and illness. And we remember those who have already gone on to be with you, who have laid down their work and are now resting and rejoicing in a far better place. And we know, Lord, that we will have our allotted time here to serve you, if, we, if that is our inclination, and then it will be gone. It will soon be over. And most of us realize now how quickly life goes by. One Christmas comes and another's on before we know it. And the year goes round like a, a merry-go-round, faster and faster. And we wonder where the years have gone. Oh, Lord, help us to number our days and to pl apply our heart to wisdom and to seek you while we still have strength and to serve you in whatever way we can. And we pray for our friends and our family and our loved ones who don't know you, who don't care about these things, who perhaps think that maybe when they're older they might take these things more seriously. But Lord, we know that life is so uncertain. We have no way of knowing how much time we've got. Oh Lord, we just pray as we worship you today, tonight, as we look at your word, as we think of the case of a particular saint, a servant of God, who lived his life for you, that we might be challenged ourselves. For we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we can continue our worship with another gospel-orientated song, and that's great as the gospel of our glorious God. <clears throat> Praise the gospel of our glorious God. 
format I'm following is, is similar to what Jimmy did with a lecture. We're going to do a part one, then have a, a song, so give you a chance to stretch your legs again, and then part two, and then close with a song. So, we're going to look at the life of Thomas Bilney. I've subtitled it, The Little Guy with a Big God. He was small, quite literally, physically as well, and in his own eyes, he seemed an insignificant character. But God can use the insignificant and the small. So we're going to look at Thomas Bilney Part 1 to begin with. Unfortunately, there's no photographs of Thomas Bilney. It was a long time ago. We're talking about nearly 500 years. And the best we've got is an engraving that someone has done of him. So we don't know whether he actually looked exactly like that or not. So who was Thomas Bilney? And why should we spend an evening finding out about him? I guess if you're honest, most of you had not heard of him before. You may have heard of some of the other more well-known um, heroes of scripture and, and uh, the history, but who was Thomas Bilney? Well, four reasons why I think it's worth looking at his life. One, he was a courageous Christian who died for his faith. Two, he was part of the great move for religious freedom brought about in the 16th century, which we sometimes refer to as the Reformation. The liberties we've got today are largely due to the men and women who lived and died and fought for them then. Three, he was the human means through which, through, used by God for converting Hugh Latimer, who ended up being one of England's greatest preachers. And four, his life and times have so many lessons for us today. Now, we can't go into all of it. Um, if you want to know more, I've obviously written a book, and uh, you'll get more detail from that. But we're just going to give an overview in the time we've got here of just a flavor of this man and what he did, and why I argue from this book that he shouldn't be a forgotten reformer. Um, so let's have a look at him. Strange times they were living in. He was born in 1495. It's quite a long time ago, isn't it? And he went as a student to Cambridge in 1510. Now, for those of you who are sharp with mathematics, he was about 14 or 15 years old when he came up from the country in Norfolk to the big city, which would have been quite a, an occasion for a 15-year-old at that time. Wasn't that unusual for um, boys that young to go to university then, at that age? Uh, but you can imagine how hard that would have been to suddenly be immersed in a whole new world on your own. He was um, going to study law. He was small, built, slightly built, reticent, shy, but determined. His plan was to study law, possibly civil law, and make quite a lucrative career as he could in those days, or maybe even become a priest. Now, that for us might seem rather strange when we think of the times, but that was his aim. Meanwhile, in Europe, around about the same time, a few years earlier, there was ferment going on because a man called Martin Luther had started a revolution by nailing 95 theses or clauses to a church door in Wittenberg. And that was setting things alight in Europe and changing things, what we call now the Great Reformation, turning the church back to its original roots. That's what it means by reforming, because the church had lost its way over centuries and have been buried in all kinds of superstitions and other teachings and traditions and so on that became known as the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Now, in this country, it was very much the same. For centuries, the rule had been by that one church. There was no alternative. You could not decide how you wanted to worship. I know there are some people today who would like to bring us back to that kind of place. So all this was going on in the background. But at first, it had little impact on this young student. And I want you just to imagine for a moment, as he went there to the college 
At the similar time, a year before he went to university, in fact, a certain king came to the throne, probably the most well-known king that we have, uh, Henry VIII. Now, to be fair, that's a later picture of Henry. Um, We always imagine him like that, don't we? But he was thin and young at one time. We tend to have this rather um, typical picture of him rather large, dressed in ermine, throwing chicken bones over his shoulder and chopping people's heads off. Well, he did do all that, but he wasn't always like that. But I think it's amazing to think that God was planning a great work in England, and he used these two men. One, little Bilney, was a student and became a Christian. Uh, Sadly, we don't really know the spiritual condition of Henry VIII. There's very little doubt that he was a true Christian of any sort. But God used them both. And it's interesting that this morning we were talking about Xerxes, weren't we? Another king who was a bit of a tyrant. And uh, he also uh, was used by God, along with Esther. So there's a kind of a parallel here. Um, Two tyrant kings. But God can do anything, can't he? He is all-powerful. Well, that was the situation. Um, Bilney was working hard at the university, and Henry VIII was developing his kingship and uh, authority in England. Now, he was the political king. He had great power, but he wasn't the religious king. The authority of the church at that time came not in England. There wasn't an Archbishop of Canterbury or a, a Church of England as we know it today. The church was ruled by Rome, by the Pope. And a certain way of life was dictated. It meant people did not have access to the Bible. They did what the priests told them. Effectively, you could put a cross through the Bible. Now, of course, there were Bibles, but they're not many, and they were in Latin, and they were inaccessible to most people. Even Bilney, with his training, uh, would have great difficulty getting hold of a Bible. And so there was this ignorance. People did not know what the gospel was really about. They believed in a system that was based on earning your way by good works. The the nature of Jesus and being born again and being saved by faith was not really known to hardly anyone. And Bilney was no exception. He didn't know any of this. He was trying to do the best he could And indeed, he was one such person who longed to be free. He had this deep fear of of not having peace with God, a bit like Martin Luther. And he longed to have this certainty about his salvation. And he did everything he could to try and please God. He went on long prayer night vigils. He did penances, pilgrimages. He made sure he was at all the meetings where he thought he could somehow please God. He was desperately unhappy and longed for that. Now, it so happened that in Europe, there were lots of things going on and people were looking back into the past. It was called the Renaissance and they were looking at the ancient history and finding old documents and beginning to rethink and asked themselves questions about religion, uh, along with other things. And there was one man, Erasmus, who was um, a Dutch scholar, and he just had translated the Bible, the New Testament, into Greek. Now, this was quite a novel thing. It was very new. And Bilney happened to get hold of one of these copies, which was quite a rare thing to do. It's also a dangerous thing to do because it was frowned upon by the authorities as a dangerous book, the New Testament, because you might find out things that you're not supposed to find out about. You had to be taught by the priest. Now, Erasmus was quite um, a strange character in many ways. He spent some time over in England, and uh, just as an aside, he wasn't too impressed with England. He thought the weather was pretty awful, and apparently he didn't like the beer either. So he stayed for a few years, but he was at the college and got to know some of the other men who were not exactly reformers, but interested in change. Bilney got hold of a copy of his New Testament. Now, we need to remember that Bilney had no preacher, 
no pastor, no Christian friends, no church, nothing to help him. He was on his own. And he got hold of one of these copies of the New Testament. And you can imagine him uh, fearful because he's not supposed to have this copy. It was a forbidden book. Going away in his little rooms, students then were quite poor. Often they spent their time begging. And Bilney was no exception. He would often go without food, but he had hold of this precious book. And I, I guess like most of us, when we got a new book, you know, you pick it up, you don't start reading it straight away, do you? You sort of flick through it and look at a couple of pages here and a couple of pages there. And I can imagine him doing that, quietly, his fingers fumbling over the pages. And he hit upon this passage in Timothy, 1 Timothy. Now, for us, it's hard to perhaps grasp the shock it was when he read these words. What was this? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Who's writing this? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was writing this. One of the great saints. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The Apostle Paul was a, a terrible sinner. This was all fresh to Bilney. And God spoke to him there and then. He had no one else to help him. God just made it clear to him. The Holy Spirit worked in his life. And for the first time in his life, he realized Jesus was his answer. It wasn't through doing things. It was through looking to him in faith. And he thought of himself as the worst sinner. He thought, well, if Paul could be saved, then there's hope for me. And that was how he became a Christian. No one helped him. Now, God was going to do something with this man's life. So he didn't just stay there and just have a little private Bible study. God set him alight with a desire to tell other people. Because he knew that there were other people who didn't know any of this. All these students in Cambridge, all these lecturers, not one of them understood these things. At least he'd not come across anyone who had. And so he bravely started to tell people what had happened to him. He shared his faith. He was a Cambridge evangelist. And it was a great danger to him because if the authorities had found out about this, he would have been in great trouble. But he couldn't stop. He just had to share his faith with others. And soon he gathered a circle of people around him who started to listen to what he was saying and take note. Cambridge was changing. God was really working, wasn't he? He was preparing the ground. He had a circle of friends around him, and they would meet in one of the local taverns, which was called the White Horse Tavern. It became so popular amongst those who were seeking to find out about this truth that was coming from abroad, from people like Luther, that they actually nicknamed it Little Germany. And people started to gather there, and many of the future reformers in the next 10 years or so met there at some point. We don't know for certain, but even Tyndale, who did his translation, may well have rubbed shoulders with Bilney at this time. There's no way of being absolutely certain, but he was certainly around at the same time. Two future archbishops of Canterbury were at there in this circle. And most important, the main one, Hugh Latimer, would later be there. He wasn't there at the moment. So... These teachings and these talkings were being circulated and Bilney was being watched. Now, Hugh Latimer, he's one of the big names, whereas Bilney is the relative small guy. He was also the champion of the time. In the church there, he was bright, articulate, eloquent, powerful. And the authorities saw in him the champion who would soon deal with these irritating little upstarts like Bilney and co. And he was that sort of person. He was absolutely devoted to the church. He was given lots of accolades. He was um, favored by many um, qualifications. And on one occasion in 1524, he was given a lecture where he was discrediting 
the reformation that was going on in Europe. In particular, a man by the name of Melanchthon, who was a close associate of Luther. And he was rubbishing his views. And you can imagine the dignitaries there, the authorities of the church, beaming as they saw this powerful man just making mincemeat of it. Now, listening to that lecture was little Bilney. He'd gone along, he'd heard a lot about this Hugh Latimer, and as he listened, he was dismayed to think that this man could cause so much trouble for him. And so he prayed. He prayed that God would change that man's life, but he didn't know how he could do it. And then he thought, well, maybe I could be the person. But who am I? I'm just little Bilney. I'm, I'm not an important person to him. So he came up with an idea. It was common then for the priest, like Hugh Latimer, to hear confessions. So Bilney thought, I'll give my confession to the great priest. So he asked uh, Hugh Latimer if he could give his confession. And of course, Hugh Latimer was delighted. He thought, oh, I've heard about you. You're that little upstart that's uh, circulating these, these ideas. Certainly, he said. And so he called him into his chambers, waiting to hear his confession and hopefully sorting out this irritating problem that was growing in Cambridge called the Reformation. Well, Bilney gave his confession. What he actually did was he shared the gospel with him. And God honoured it. As Bilney humbly opened up his heart and told him exactly what had happened and how Jesus had changed his life, Latimer was stunned. He was broken by the end of the confession. and The tears were down his face. The one who was given the confession then became the pastor. And the mighty priest became the penitent. And Latimer humbly asked him to tell him more. That was a courageous thing of Billy to do, wasn't it? Knowing the guy and, and what his standing was and how he could have reported him. But God was at work. And Hugh Latimer was transformed. <coughs> they were inseparable now as friends. They used to go together, pray together. And, and Billy, I guess, was like Barnabas. And Latimer was going to be the future kind of Paul. He was going to be much more used by God than Billy ever would. But it was Billy who started the ball rolling. And they would go around talking, preaching, discussing, doing what they could. There was a hill um, there called... Uh, Castle Hill, and because the two of them were so often going up there talking, it got nicknamed Heretic's Hill, because of course a heretic was someone who broke away from the established church of the day and started talking about these ideas like Luther. And they were both being watched carefully. Well, we're going to pause there and uh, have a song and give you a chance to stretch your legs and come to part two and tell you what happens next. So if we could... Um, sing the next song, which very much reflects Bilney's new position. My soul finds rest in God alone. <clears throat> Salvation, a fortress strong. 
Bill Lee Part 2. As you probably can gather, once this man got a hold of the gospel and what it could do, especially when he saw the result in uh, Hugh Latimer's life. And by the way, they didn't just go around talking and preaching. What is, I find very touching about the whole thing is that they actually lived their faith out. They actually went helping prisoners, the sick. There was a leper hospital not far away. Now, try and imagine 500 years ago what a leper hospital would be like. Think of the standard of health and hygiene and the capabilities of what staff there might have been. And Thomas Bilney with with Latimer used to go there visiting, bandaging up the sores of lepers at great risk to themselves. So it wasn't just preaching the gospel, it was living the gospel, sharing, caring, for other people. Well, Bilney had the burden now to preach wider. He'd seen what God could do in Cambridge, and there was a real stir going on. But now he had uh, Latimer and others who were taking up the role. Bilney looked out and realized there was a bigger world outside. And so he took a friend with him, another man by the name of Thomas Arthur, and decided he would go further afield preaching the gospel, which at that time, in those days, was the most dangerous thing you could probably do. And so he did. He'd already been warned by the chief church leader of the time, Cardinal Wolsey, to just keep in line. He was being very gentle with him to begin with, but aware that Bilney had got hold of something, and he was saying, now, you toe the line. Bilney had to obey God rather than man. So he went out, started preaching. Now, we need to understand he wasn't perfect. He didn't understand the Bible as well as many of us would. He was still working his way through. Remember, he had no one to help him, humanly speaking. And he did make mistakes. He didn't get everything clear. But one thing he did know with absolute crystal clarity, Jesus Christ saves sinners. And he preached that. He did start preaching against some of the church practices, Uh, against the papal authority and against certain superstitions and intercession of the saints and praying for the dead and, and so on like that. There were many things he attacked courageously, but his his heart was to preach the gospel. And of course, it was novel. Uh, There were friars who would go around preaching, but no one had heard a man like do this before. And ordinary people, people in the marketplace, were suddenly listening to a man telling them that Jesus can save them. And it was totally new. And it was novel, and people were coming and gathering. But he was creating a stir wherever he went, the two of them. And on two occasions, he was actually pulled out of the pulpit while preaching. Imagine that happening, Jimmy. (laughs) Physically pulled out because they were so offended by what he was saying, and they were trying to shut him up. The friars would go down like, you know, the heavy brigade, and as soon as they saw him, they got him and dragged him out. But he didn't stop. He went back, just like the Apostle Paul did in those uh, stories in Acts. He was determined to um, carry on and do as much as he could before he got caught. Well, it was inevitable that he was going to get caught. People were watching him. People were reporting, people were taking note of what he was saying, and eventually he was brought before the authorities. Not the civil authorities, the religious authorities. But you need to remember, in those days, the religious authorities were virtually all-powerful. And uh, all they had to do, if they found someone to be a heretic, they would hand them over to the civil authorities, and they could be executed. They were that powerful. And Bilney knew that. Well, he tried to defend himself. He fought against the the charges that they put. He said that he hadn't done anything wrong. He was only preaching from the Bible. And the arguments went on. And I tried to detail some of that in the book. But eventually, after days and days, he was worn down. He was constantly being harassed and challenged by these very able, learned men. His own friends were concerned for him. Now, Bilney was not very robust. He often went without food, so he was quite a weak man physically. And they were worried for him, and they started to say to him, look, 
just, just, just recant. That means say you're wrong about these things. And, and they'll be all right. You, you'll be okay. You'll get a sentence of sorts, but you'll still be alive. And think what good work you can do. Now, Bilney always had a low opinion of himself and a high opinion of others. And sadly, and we can't excuse him for this, but we can understand, sadly, he listened and he recanted. He was given a two-year prison sentence and he had to parade in front, in the, in the, in the town, uh, wearing a cap on his head. It was very humiliating. And then he was put in prison. And as soon as that happened, he realized what a terrible thing he'd done. He should not have listened to his friends. He should have listened to his conscience. He should have been stronger. He should have been braver. Now, we may feel like we ought to censure him, but how would you have been if you knew that refusing to recant meant you'd be executed in a most brutal way? The, the form was to burn, to be burnt alive at a stake. It's very easy for us from cozy 21st century to say, oh, he should have done better, shouldn't he? He spent two years in absolute agony of remorse, realizing that he'd let his Lord down. And those two years, we don't know what happened, but he, he went through agony of soul. Eventually, he was released and able to go back to his friends, but he was a broken man. And they worried for him. Hugh Latimer records how he had to keep an eye on him just in case he did something silly because he just wasn't the same man. He knew what he'd done. He'd let his Lord down. Now, we don't know what happened exactly. Maybe he read something about Peter perhaps being restored in the Bible and uh, he realized that God is merciful even when we fail him bitterly. And he came to a point around about 1531 when he suddenly changed. He realized God's mercy is far greater than he ever understood. And he decided that he was going to start again. He was going to go and preach once more, even though he'd promised the authorities that he wouldn't. And he used a phrase once. He said to his friends, I'm going to Jerusalem. Now, we know in the Bible when Jesus said he's going to Jerusalem, he meant he's going up to die effectively. And we may censure Bilney for using that phrase. I mean, who was he to make, dare make that kind of comparison? But we know what he meant. He was going to die. He knew he was going to preach, and that would be he'd get caught and he'd die. But he didn't care. He wanted to make up for the time he'd lost. So he went out to Norwich and down to London, preaching wherever he could. Now, by then, till, um, Tyndale's uh, new translation come out and Billy got copies of that. He was get, handing those out and giving out tracts and sharing with people the gospel, knowing that any moment he was going to get caught, taken up, and that was it. That requires quite some bravery, doesn't it, really, to do that, knowing that you're going to die. Well, he did that until he was finally caught in Norwich and brought before the tribunals again and pressurized once more to recant. And this time, he didn't. No, he said, I will not. They tried and they pressurized him, they cajoled him. Even those who were trying him didn't really want to take him through this inevitable judgment. But he would not this time. He wouldn't let his Lord down. He uh, spent the last night uh, before his execution, surprisingly in good spirits. His friends were able to come and visit him, and they, they saw him eating a hearty meal with a smile on his face, and they couldn't understand it. And they said, y you're going to die tomorrow. How can you be so easy about it? But he was a different man now. God was working in his soul, and he was at peace. He'd done the right thing. He used to quote often, from Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. I think we've got it up there. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. 
when you walk through the fire, and he was going to walk through the fire, literally, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Isaiah 43, 1. Well, they did set him ablaze later, but he was, his faith was so strong now. He knew that God would take him through. His friends were amazed at his courage and couldn't understand it. And at one point, it said that he actually saw a candle and he put his finger in the, can, in the flame and said, I am not afraid to die for Jesus. Well, the final morning came in Norwich where he had to go on this famous walk. And uh, I just um, read a few passages from um, the book I've written. I think the guy here does it better than I can say it, so let's try. Try and imagine now, this is the morning of his final walk. He's going to be executed and going to actually be killed. The following morning, Bilney rose early and gave himself to prayer. Never was prayer sweeter. There was a heavenly touch about the small room. He was in the presence of his Savior, and later that very day would see him with his own eyes. After a simple breakfast, he was taken out of the guild hall, guarded either side by men with claves and halberts. As they stepped out into the daylight, he was met by one friend who would be his only companion allowed for the journey. This was Dr. Warner, a doctor of divinity and longtime friend. As Bilney left the hall and walked down the steps, he was met by a curious crowd of friends and foes. One of his friends held out his hand and sought to encourage him to remain constant and prayed that God would enable him to take his death as patiently as he could. Bilney paused, and I'll just paraphrase what he said. He said, look, not to fear, I'm like a sailor in a storm. The storm is serious, but I'm sailing to the haven where I'll be safe. They continued to weave their way through the narrow streets, now crammed with jostling crowds. Bilney, with, with Warner at his side, held his nerve and was even able to distribute what money he still had to needy hands. He moved in an easterly direction to the final gate leading out of the city, known as Bishop's Gate, then across Bishop's Bridge to the fateful place of execution, known as Lollard's Pit. Uh, Lollardy was a, a, a group, a movement that happened earlier on in the previous century. Um, John Wycliffe and others were involved in that, and many of them were burnt for their faith. There, near the banks of the river, under the shadow of St. Leonard's Hill, was a depression in the land where he would be executed. And so Bilney, accompanied by his friend, descended into the pit, dressed in simple clothes with hair disheveled, a diminutive figure. A pile of wood was placed around the stake in readiness, and Bilney paused and turned to face the crowds and asked if he might have leave to address them. He was given permission, and so he told them about Jesus and encouraged them as best he could. Then Bilney stepped to the pile and removed his gown, handing it to his friend. He knelt down on a little ledge in front of the stake with eyes and hands raised to heaven, and he prayed that God would receive his soul, ending with Psalm 143, verse 1 to 3, which says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight, no man living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have been long dead. It goes on. Uh, he's finally fastened to the wood, and the last thing he did before he was going to be executed, some of the men who were going to do the job, the priests, had noticed a change in the crowd. The mood had changed, and they were worried. And they actually had the goal to ask Bilney if he would speak to the crowd on their behalf before they actually executed him, because they feared for their own lives, 
and they feared that the crowd might turn against them, possibly have implications for uh, giving alms in, in future days and so on. And so with good grace, Bilney turned to the crowd and told them not to blame these men, words of effect. And that was his last words before he prayed to God. And then they set light to the pile and he died as a martyr. Latimer, his good friend, on hearing the news of his friend, mourned deeply, perhaps wondering if he too would one day share Bilney's fate. He referred to Bilney as that blessed martyr. And so ends the story of Thomas Bilney, scholar and martyr for the faith, once delivered to the saints. I'd just like to finish with a, a few conclusions about um, what this says about the man and just a few comments to make us think about our own faith. We don't live in such times, thank goodness. But we are still being challenged, aren't we, in our own ways. Why should we remember Bilney? Well, firstly, he stands out as the most courageous man, despite his shortcomings, and he did have many. Apart from the earlier burnings of the Lollards, he was the first one of the Reformation time to die for his faith, for truths that we now take for granted. Though he faltered, he did in the end make good. He stood resolute in the final hour, despite the temptation to again recant. Some say he deliberately courted martyrdom, and that may be so, but it was only to redeem the ground he'd lost. He stands and remains a man of heroic faith who would not flinch even in the flames. Secondly, and I think this is important for us, Bilney stands as a great role model in evangelism, personal evangelism. As we have seen, he led several to faith, including one future Archbishop of Canterbury and, of course, Hugh Latimer. And we don't know how many exactly. There may have been many. We're not given all the details. His greatest trophy, of course, was Hugh Latimer, who went on to be one of the great preachers and one of the mighty reformers uh, a few years later. So he serves as an example of someone who once... Once he got hold of the truth, couldn't keep it to himself. And remember, he did it in times that were far, far more dangerous than the times we're likely to live in. Also, and I think this is helpful, Bilney utilized what was, he was given. Unlike the man with one talent, he did not bury it, but put it to good use to win the man with five talents, Hugh Latimer. Even the great C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers we've ever had, was converted by the preaching of an unknown, uneducated lay preacher who could hardly put string several sentences together, but God used it to convert Spurgeon, who in turn became a mighty preacher. We may not have much talent. We may not consider ourselves to be very gifted or able. We may be more like Bilney, but God still has a work for us. And then, of course, I mentioned he didn't only preach his faith, he lived it out. He followed James, faith without works is dead. He went about helping prisoners, bandaging up lepers, and sharing his faith with whoever would listen. So I'd just like to con conclude with these words. It's important for us to remember that the opposition to the gospel and freedom to express it has not changed since Bilney's time. There are still people today who want to silence us. And we live in times where we have the liberties that were hard fought by men like Bilney. And we are in danger, aren't we, of losing some of them again. We may not ever come into times as barbaric as these times were, when Christians were brutally put to death. But we live in a world where that's still happening, don't we? In other parts, in other countries, this sort of thing is still happening. So I think Bilney's life is a challenge to us. He was the first of many. He didn't get things right perfectly, perfectly. 
He stumbled, but he did his best for the Lord, didn't he? And I think that's what we should all be challenged to do. Let's just pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of a man like Bilney, who was impacted by the life of the Apostle Paul and what he wrote, who in turn was impacted when he met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so ultimately, Lord, it goes back to that great saviour we have, the Lord Jesus Christ, who could save the chief of sinners. And we pray, Lord, maybe there's someone here who is not a Christian, but they've just listened to the life of this little man, this relative nobody, who has now been nearly 500 years in heaven rejoicing with you. Who knows what you can do with a life that's ready and willing. So help us all, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have got some copies of this, if anyone would like to buy a copy. It's half price at the moment, so the, the main price is £7, but I've got some copies that I can sell for 3 50 So first come, first served.
invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.